Well, first of all, com um, Custom Cells actually is one of the leading companies in developing and uh, manufacturing battery cells whenever it comes to high performance. And we want to talk a little bit about innovations. Actually, we too, the companies are in touch for a long, long time. But actually, Vince and I do have a corona relationship. So we meet first time here on stage. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I guess everybody, if you know, managing innovations is difficult. And there are lots of trade-offs. And uh, one of them, for example, is the precise timing. So if you're too late, you're in a kind of difficult competition situation. If you're too early, in best case, it's just too expensive. OK, so we try to position our innovation something like four, say, five to eight times ahead of industrialization. So I said, OK, let's look back what happened throughout the last eight years. And I will just take a few of these examples to show how innovations actually would work. So one actually has just been mentioned by the previous um, presenter, which is high performance, um, high temperature cells. So we actually managed to make and manufacture cells up to uh, 150 um, centigrades. Uh, applications are, for example, uh, driller hats a few miles down near the earth, um, high reliability, high safety, high temperatures. And uh, well, you might you might consider this as a niche, but as already earlier I mentioned in the previous talk. OEMs, automotive OEMs, start uh, poaching us like, uh, well, you know, if you could bring down costs a little, we could get rid of a few thousand dollars per car cooling system. So it might become also a different application a little later. Another example actually is a flexible manufacturing line. So we, we know all um, the constraints of manufacturing and costs. Say, OK, we'll bring it down in terms of cost, bring up the quality, uh, get out the risks. Just try to have um, few flexibilities in there, and the rest of it is straightforward and all the same. So we thought the different way, say, OK, well, if there are applications which have very low economy of scale, where do we find actually a platform, something like um, economy of scale, one or two levels below? And we just introduced a couple of degrees of freedom. Well, that cell looks a little bit fancy, but it actually was really produced. And we figured out you just need very few more degrees of freedom to come to a flexible um, cell manufacturing design, actually. Well, and here's the connection point to Vince uh, as one example. So um, silicon actually has been throughout the, old, uh, the whole um, line of innovation throughout the, uh, the last years. One of our points where we look to, uh, I guess it's very obvious that simply the, the specific capacities have been the driving factor. I leave this to you, Vince. Uh, and I guess the highlight of the innovations, I guess, is rather this. I'll uh, give it a full picture right away. So we are one of the very few who is not just talking and researching about pre -lithiations. We are manufacturing cells since more than three years, which are pre -lithiated. And we've gone through, um, I guess, 15 different ways of pre uh, physically. And uh, here, just uh, three chosen ones. I guess the material pre is well known by most of you. And that's one thing which bring, comes at a very good cost point and a couple of other advantages. Yeah, on the other hand side, uh, we do have um, wet chemical bath which is um, obviously kind of well understood technology on the one hand side in terms of you know, how do you uh, run the process, et cetera. But in terms of pre it comes with a couple of challenges. But the potential of getting this industrialized is pretty high. That's what we see. And I guess uh, you all um, maybe you might have heard about uh, PET transfer. So in the end, you print the pre on the uh, materials, which is kind of a way you can do it as well. All of them come with advantages and disadvantages. Going into details is quite interesting. And that is, for us, a huge field for innovation and in getting this um, licensed. So we actually um, currently feed customers like Porsche and like Lilium with our technologies. So that's um, one way how we also, uh, in the end, monetize our innovations by IP. And I guess that's a perfect point in time to hand over to Vince. Thank innovations you. and IP. My name is Vincent Privinage, and I come from Silicon Valley, from Palo Alto. And I'd like to talk today about a technology called Synanode, adeptly uh, silicon for EV cells, and the company 1D Material, which, or 1D Battery Science, in which General Motor recently invested. But rather than talking just about technology, the point of view I'd like to bring to this audience is the view that I've had for the last 30 years living in Silicon Valley 
about answering one question. What does it take for a new technology to be adopted at large scale? And to answer that question, I'm going to start by asking any in the audience does not know the name Dolby. Probably you all do. And the name Arm, you probably also do. And these two companies actually started in Cambridge in the UK. And um, are well known as the two companies that have touched the most human over the last 50 years of any new technologies. Yet neither company manufactures anything. They both rely on innovation and creating an ecosystem through IP licensing. And I want you to think about the implication of that. There is more than 200 billion CPUs that have been shipped using the ARM architecture. As a matter of fact, the Apple Silicon now that replaced Intel is made using ARM. ARM licensed the IP to Apple. Apple fine-tuned the CPU and tips it out to TSMC. Now, let's apply those lessons to the world of EVs. And I'm going to start with the upper right corner. What is the most needed? Today, there is no EV that sells for 30,000 euro, has more than 300 miles range, and can charge in 30 minutes from 10 to 30% of full charge. And people believe, all of the people in the automotive industry, that if you can deliver that, that represents more than 50% of the market. Today, we have only scratched the surface with the EVs that are too expensive or limited in range or charging speed. Now, before I talk about technology, in order to get there, what are the concerns of the OEM? We only deal in EV cell. Um, our entire companies only deal with EV cells. And our customers have two worries. One is supply chain. How do I get the supply chain at scale, localized in the region, and resilient? And the other concern they have is how do I do it at cost in a way that is profitable and where the investment have a positive ROI? If you cannot answer those questions, it doesn't matter what the technology does. Technology is necessary. People want a competitive advantage, but only if those questions represent a path from the lower left corner to the upper right corner of the chart. So what do we do? Well, our CTO started working with his R&D team on this 15 years ago. And what he did was brilliant. Instead of using a brand new carbon framework, he decided to use EV-grade graphite that is already produced at scale and low cost and already qualified with cell makers. And through a process called Synanode, we can grow silicon nanowires, tiny little spaghetti of silicon, inside the pores of the graphite. And you see the size there, those little spaghetti have a diameter that is one fifth of the coronavirus. And they literally like little extension core that are plugged into the graphene so they can receive the electrons in and out. And they are so thin that the lithium ion can get in and out. And then we invented some special coating, which is shown on the right, to make the life cycle longer and the conductivity for faster charging. Now, how does that work from a supply chain perspective? Well, we use existing graphite already produced at scale in the hundreds of thousands of tons, and existing saline that is used in the solar cell industry already produced in the thousands of tons. But then the brilliance of our CTO was to use a piece of equipment that already exists for the solar cell industry. That's the machine in the middle. Not a new machine, an existing machine. If you go to China, you'll see hundreds of those machines. And we modify it so that instead of putting wafers inside the process tube, we can put catalyzed graphite, commercial graphite. And what comes out is enhanced graphite with the silicon nanowires that can be used in all the existing factories. This increases the value of the graphite, increases the volume, because for a certain amount of graphite capacity, we triple the capacity and can then serve three times more EVs, decrease the cost because the process is half the cost of the graphite itself, and it's patented globally. We have about 240 granted patents all over Europe, United States, uh, Korea, China, and Japan. Now, why is that important? 
Our business model relies on propagating innovation the same way that Arm and Dolby did. We engage with each customer with a JDA, a joint development agreement. So for example, with GM, which is non-exclusive, we integrate our technology in their design to meet their specs. And that's a small R&D program that maybe lasts a year. Then we have built a pilot facility and each customer can have their own facility where ma one machine can produce up to 100 tons a year, which is about 340 megawatt hours, which is about 5,000 to 10,000 battery pack, which is required for qualification pre-production. And then finally, and this is important, instead of trying to be Intel, we're trying to be ARM. That is to say, we have large industrial partners very large chemical companies that have built chemical plants all over the world, which can license the technology. We do a technology transfer, and the OEMs can rely on those monster industrial companies to execute the 10,000 tons required to save millions of EVs. Now, in summary, what I presented is not just a technology. It's a platform. And it's a platform that does two things, increase performance and reduce cost. But the only way to propagate this platform is to collaborate, whether it's with Dirk's company or with GM or some of the other customers that we have not yet disclosed. So I hope that that answers the question about how we hope to make this prevalent in the automotive industry. Thank you. Yes. Thank yourself. you very much, Dirk and Vincent. May I ask one question first? We talked a lot about collaboration yeah. um, already. The two of you are collaborating. What are the key success factors for your collaboration? Obviously, it is not what is very often mentioned that you need to meet physically first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, there are actually two things, right? One is that each party understand with clarity what they bring to the table. There need to be some synergies. One plus one equals three or four. Mm -hmm. I think the second is to have a very clear goal, and the best goal is to have one or two key customers that want the two companies to work together. Mm -hmm. Because customers are what I call an aligning force, a commercial force. And then the third, I think it's integrity. When we work together, there will be new IP created, and you need a process to handle that so that you can distinguish between the background IP and the jointly created IP. And we, that, we try to do that in all of the relationships we have, which are non-exclusive, because we want to be a platform, but respecting the confidentiality of each Very customer. interesting. Very comprehensive yeah. answer, Dave. Yeah, I perfectly um, yeah. echo on this. I think the first thing is some complementary skills. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, I would just summarize this as trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Now we have some more specific questions from the audience. Um, I think this one popped up, Dick, when you were presenting. How flexible are your production lines with regard to geometries and dimensions? Yeah, that obviously very much depends on which line you look at. So we do have very different lines. So some of them are just megawatt scale, which are very small for specific applications. And they have actually a, um, a flexibility which goes 200, 300 percent. So it's huge. And we do have, for example, um, fully automatized lines, which are gigawatt scale, and which go into automotive. And they're just industry standard. Standard. So it simply depends on the application. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is sustainability a true value or greenwashing? How do you answer that question? Yeah, actually, it's an excellent <laughs> question. So if you take the graphite used in EV cell in the United States today, almost all of it comes from China and is graphitized with coal power energy. If you take natural graphite coming, for example, from a Nouveau Monde graphite in Quebec or Syrah's resources in Louisiana, they use hydroelectricity and the carbon footprint of the graphite is about 90% down. So only 10% of the Chinese imported graphite. Once you add uh, silicon using our technology, you actually reduce that by another 50%. So you end up with 5% of carbon footprint. And remember, the graphite is the highest number of kilogram in an EV pack and the largest carbon footprint in an EV pack. So reducing it to 5% of what it is today, it's a big deal. Interesting. Dick, anything to add? Yeah, I would actually tackle the question from a high-level point of view. So for me, true sustainability is also true value. The question is what is true, I guess. And in the end, uh, I would say I just make a comparison. So um, looking to myself and to, into my French and, and the, the society around, uh, most of the people are willing, for example, to, to pay some extra for some good food. 
for green food, for, for eco food. So the, the eco label uh, actually kind of, it's, it's quite some value. So whenever people trustfully see some value and it's true sustainability, they're willing to pay for it. If they're willing to pay for it, it's value. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. There are two questions. I think, uh, Vincent, you, you talked about that in your presentation. The one, the business model and the Synode technology. These questions maybe ask a little bit more for the differentiating factors versus competitive solutions and um, why, why does it work? <laughs> it's okay. always the question. So one thing we don't do, we don't take some kind of polymers and pyrolyze it to make a special nanos nanoscale scaffold in carbon. We did that 15 years ago. Others are doing it today. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that is different. I think the second part is shape matters. A nanowire is a long, thin spaghetti. It has a very different relationship between the surface and the volume than nanoparticles. And that's very important to reduce the reactivity with the electrolyte. And the third piece is that the nanowires plug into the graphene so that the speed of electron coming in and out is very, very fast. And those three things at the technology level is the differentiation. At the business level is we don't want to be Intel, therefore we license the technology, which we can only do because we have sufficient IP. Interesting, interesting. Um, for you, Dirk, what are the key innovations Custom Cells currently contributes uh, or works on? Yeah, for us, there's a couple of different items. So we're especially kind of a connecting point between innovations, new technologies. So we especially work out very high performance cells. So Porsche is one of our customers, Lilium. So we are at very high performance technology on the one hand side, but also look very much on the processes over to get this into mass manufacturing. And parts of that are obviously, for example, reduce, especially the footprint of gigawatt factories. Another aspect is what I mentioned earlier, prelithiation technologies, as an example. And uh, prelithiation, of course, if you think it more general, goes into water booster technologies, which you can put on top of the base technologies. These right. are examples. Thank you very much. And then there is interest in the aviation industry. How do you foresee this industry, <laughs> this market, to pick up speed? Who would like to? Yeah, maybe those are our customers in the end. Um, so we do foresee in the end a kind of a bifold development. One of that is obviously it has a totally different character. One of that is eVTOL. Everybody was talking about eVTOLs for, for a long time. But we do see that that the eVTOL challenge on the one side is big. If you could compare it to autonomous driving, for example, say, well, it gets delayed and delayed on the one side, but definitely there's a certain use to society. So we see it coming, but it will come later, and the challenges in terms of battery technology are significantly higher. On the, and the other, on the other hand side, you also have the CTOL market, the conventional takeoff and landing, which has got a totally different profile. So in the end, the overpower you need for a conventional takeoff and landing is something like a factor of two in comparison to a factor of six to eight in eVTOL. So it's significantly lower and has got a totally different risk profile. And do see that, for example, markets like Norway, et cetera, one by one get into regulation and simply say, well, you know, short-term trips um, on the plane uh, might become um, simply electric or must be an electric trip. And the same accounts also for mid-range, and I guess there will be at some point in time also a ban of, well, you know, occupancy of, an, of a big airplane is just 50%. Mm -hmm. Let's cancel the flight. So that might happen pretty soon. Very interesting. Anything to add? Because there's maybe a question for you, Vincent, now. How, how do you look forward, or how do you foresee anode-free battery technologies? Yeah. In which so anode-free is another way to talk about lithium metal anodes, mm -hmm. and in conjunction with solid-state electrolyte, like ceramic electrolyte. I'm going to make a statement that I hope does not offend anybody in the room. There will not be large-scale, i.e. millions of EVs, with lithium metal anode this decade, or even the beginning of the next decade. And there's two fundamental reasons. In one EV battery pack, the surface area of the separator is 800 square meters. If you're going to charge and discharge lithium metal over and over again with no defect over that amount of surface area, nobody has ever built such a ceramic separator. Number two, it's a safety issue. A fully charged 100 kilowatt hour battery will have about 10 to 12 kilograms of lithium metal now, lithium metal, if you expose it to humid air, is a bomb. It's an exothermic reaction. Now, you can always protect it with a lot of other stuff around it, but then you lose the advantage. So I think that graphite enhanced by silicon 
is going to be the dominant anode for the rest of the decade and probably the next decade. Right. 